So next, what we are going to discuss is what are the steps involved in the development of a data science model? So as we discussed, data science can be applied in a variety of different applications, and then there are going to be specifics uh, for each of those applications. However, there are some generic rules that we can discuss. If we have a, have a data science problem, let's say we want to predict who painted a particular picture, then the first step that we need to do is to identify that particular problem. And then we would need to identify what sort of data would we need. So in this case, in this particular example of identifying artists, we would need paintings by different artists. And we would need to digitize those paintings and we would need to transfer them into the computer. Okay? So we'll all, uh, we'll, we'll need to identify and acquire all of that data, which is the second step over here that you can see. Let me turn on my pointer. So, so the second step, yep, this one. And the next step is we're going to pre-process the data. So we're going to clean up the data. We can use various transformations here. For example, we can adjust for contrast or we can, we, if the picture is tilted, we can correct that. So all that pre-processing and pre data preparation goes into step number three. Once we have the clean data, we model that data. And what that means, this is where machine learning comes in. And the steps involved in that is first we need to identify features. We extract some unique characteristics for e from each painting that allow us to identify who painted this. And then we need to select different types of machine learning algorithms that we would use for classification of this data. So we can use like neural networks, we can use support vector machines, KNRS neighbors or tree-based specifiers. We're going to talk about all of them, but in this step, the goal is to identify and, and apply the model. Now, each machine learning model has a set of internal parameters, as we're going to see, and those parameters need to be tuned for it to be able to classify correctly. So for the, for the example that we are taking of classifying artists, there are going to be some parameters of the model itself, of the machine learning model, that need to be adjusted for it to be able to classify correctly. And that process is typically done over training data, for which we already have the labels, we, we have a data set in which we know for each painting who the, who the true artist for that particular painting is. And we use that information to train this algorithm and that involves setting some parameters of this machine learning model. And once we have that, uh, once, we, once we are done with the training bit uh, over here, then we can test it on a small part of the training data itself that we have not used for training. So we have, a, we have a big data set, we can take a small data set, a small part of that set, data set and keep it aside to do what is called validation. So that is a required step, just to make sure that the machine learning model is able to learn some things. And we're going to discuss some specific examples of how to do this, but this is a general step that we need to do at this stage. Once that is done and we are satisfied that the machine learning model is working correctly, then what we do is we go ahead and uh, after verification, we go ahead and deploy it. So let's say if you want to make an AI that uh, takes a look at a picture or a painting and, and identifies who the artist is, this, these are the steps that you would need to follow. It sounds really easy and most of the time it's, it's not too hard, but it's not such a linear process as well as you would first do this step and then you are going to do the step number two and then at the end you would get your model. The actual process that we follow is a bit more complicated. So once we have identified the problem, we may do multiple rounds of identifying the problem and defining it more and more clearly. Are we going to use two artists only or is it going to be generic? Let's say for 15 different artists. What era of paintings are we going to? Is there a restriction on the era that we are going to use, on the painting era that we are going to use? What type of paintings should we classify? What type of sensors do we need to use? All that going to identifying the problem. Once we have, uh, and that involves not only data science, but it also involves other economic factors. That's why it's important to put, put data science and the design of these algorithms into the, and understand the bigger picture there, so that you're able to design an effective technology. Once that is done, uh, you can do multiple rounds of data acquisition as well. Uh, so you can collect data in phases, you can collect, use different types of sensors, cameras in this case, or scanners. Once we have that, you may do different types of pre-processing as well. So this is also a repetitive process. And 
then you go on to different types of models. You can use different models. So again, this is also, uh, so you can do multiple phases of this. The same goes for the last two stages. But what's also important is that if you, ident if you have identified any types of errors in your models, then you can at this stage, let's say, then what you can do is go back to the previous stage. And at times you even have to go back to the very beginning. So it's, it's kind of like sometimes there's snakes and ladders. That's my analogy of designing machine learning systems. Sometimes you don't need to do anything and sometimes based on the particular problem that, and the data and the algorithms that you're trying to use, you may have to do multiple rounds of this whole stuff. I hope that clarifies the stages that are involved in the development of this model. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask me, but it's a, these are the major steps that you would be taking when you are developing uh, data science models. When we are trying to construct these models for prediction, then what we need to do in order to solve this problem is to understand that the predictions that we generate from a machine learning model or from a data science model are about a real world phenomena. And we use typically use a sensor to abstract away or to represent that real world phenomena in the computer. So in this case, uh, the example that we were taking of classifying paintings, uh, the real world phenomena is a painting and the artist that we want to associate a given painting to. Uh, and we want to represent both the artist, which can be a simple number, let's say artist number one and artist number two and artist number three. And we also want to represent the painting. In this case, we can either do it using a scanner or we can do it using a camera or any other scanning mechanism that allows us to digitize that data and represent it in the computer. Then what we need to do is to collect sufficient amount of data, label data, and uh, uh, that means paintings together with for which the painter is known. Once we have that, we extract certain features that classify that that are discriminatory across different different artists. So from each painting itself, ideally, what we want to extract is some unique characteristics that allow us to classify who painted this. Now that can be guided either through human intuition. So just like you were able to classify based on the on the general style or natural or the degree of natural scenes in a given painting uh, who painted a particular painting we can do this feature extraction step uh, manually we can by manually i mean we can write programs to extract specific features or in the new era of deep learning if we have sufficient data we should be able to identify these features completely automatically from the given image so that's the next step over here so once sensors are used for digitization and representation of data, and once we have that, what we do is we extract unique characteristics of different examples, okay? Once we have that, we can use a machine learning model such as, uh, let's say, a support vector machine, or we can use neural networks, we can use random forests or other types of machine learning models that we are going to try, going to try and discuss uh, in, the, in the coming lectures. And once we have that, we generate a decision. I hope this gives you a good understanding of what's involved in the development of all of the applications that we discussed earlier. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take a very hypothetical and almost nonsensical classification problem. And, and this is deliberately chosen. And the problem that we are going to class, going to you, going to uh, try and solve and pass it through all the steps that we've just discussed is to classify uh, whether a person is a pathologist, a medical doctor or a pathologist, or are they a computer scientist based on uh, their native environment. So we're going to take pictures of people working in their native environment, and then we are going to classify them whether they're a pathologist or a computer scientist. For those people who haven't seen a pathologist at work, they are medical doctors who work in labs and they are typically bent over a, over a microscope trying to analyze some tissue that has been given to them to make a judgment of who or, or what, the, what the tissue tells them, in, let's say about cancer or anything else. So that's what they do. They sometimes wear white coats, sometimes they wear uh, blue, overalls for lab work, they have uh, lab aprons. And uh, so those are the sort of characteristics that we can use to classify a pathologist from a computer scientist. 
On the other hand, computer scientists like me are typically bent or bent on a, and they're looking into a screen. So, so, and, and uh, they don't wear white lab coats typically, but sometimes some people can, but uh, not many computer scientists do. So we are, what we are going to do is we are going to use the same steps that we discussed. We're going to use a camera to digitize the picture of a person. Then we are going to extract some features, whether, for example, the features can be whether a person is wearing a white coat, which allows me to tell whether a person is a pathologist or, um, or not. Typically, if a person is wearing a, wearing a white coat, they're more likely to be a pathologist than a computer scientist. Remember, uh, this is a very made up or a hypothetical example. So don't think too deeply about it. Okay, so there are only two types of people in the world. It just assumes that there are pathologists and then there are computer scientists. We don't uh, take any other class into this, uh, in, into this uh, classification problem. Although it's not a realistic modeling, there can be other types of uh, people. Of course, there are. There can be statisticians. There can be other types of medical doctors. Uh, but we are not considering that for this particular classification problem. Let's say we've got two classes, pathologist versus computer scientist. So these are the features that we can use. Uh, they can have, uh, they can be wearing, so one feature can be whether a person is wearing white coats or not, and uh, whether they have a lab ap apron, this would be a T. Whether they're wearing an apron or not, whether they have a computer screen in front of them or whether they have a microscope in, them, in front of them. So if a person has a microscope in front of them, rather than, a, rather than being a computer scientist, they are more likely to be a pathologist. And of course, uh, since our sensor is a camera, we will not be able to capture income directly at least, uh, but there can be other features. This is just there to indicate that you can have other features. What we are going to do in this made up problem or in this uh, hypothetical problem is we are going to use just two features. And the next step that we talked about is to collect data. So what we are going to do is to represent the two features on, on a scatter plot. So what we do is we take the two features that we are, we are given for this problem. We have computer screen, whether there is a computer screen in front of a person, and we take the whiteness in their dressing. So if a person is wearing a white lab coat, they are going to score high on this axis. And if they have a number of computer screens in front of them, then they're going to score high on the y axis. Okay, so let's say th this is our first example. This is a person who is a computer scientist and we, in we know that uh, based on our background knowledge and that's why I've used this red color around that particular person and they have four screens in front of them. That's why they, they score pretty high on this, vertical on this vertical computer screen axis. And the, they're not wearing white, so the whiteness in their dressing is pretty low. So that's why they are over here. So these two points now represent a particular person. This is the abstraction that I was talking about. We have a real world person and a real world environment. And now we have used these two features to abstract away everything else and represent that particular individual or an example in this case of the positive class by these two numbers only. And that allows me to make a scatter plot just like this one and represent other individuals as well. Let's uh, take an example of a pathologist. So this is a pathologist who has a microscope in front of them and they have a white lab coat and I indicate that they are a pathologist by using a green uh, rectangle around them. Okay. Similarly, we can collect other examples. This is another person who's a computer scientist and they have three laptop screens in front of them, not four like the other guy at the top. So they're going to score a little bit lower on this axis, but they're also not wearing, uh, uh, wearing white. So that's why their value from the X axis is pretty low. Next, this is another pathologist. Uh, this person is a pathologist who's working in the lab and they have, a, they have an app on. So the whiteness in their dressing is pretty low, let's say. And they don't have a computer screen in front of them, so that's why their value on the y-axis is pretty low. Again, this is a hypothetical example, and it, it des it's designed to be awkward. So, and so the what what we are getting at is how can we represent data in what is called a feature space? And for up till now, what we have done is we have represented four data points in our feature space. We can collect more data. 
like this is another pathologist. They don't have a microscope in front of them. They don't have a computer screen in front of them. They're not wearing white. So that's why they are gonna score like this, okay? This is another person who has a computer screen in front of them. This is a computer scientist. They don't have any white in front of them, okay? We can collect, this is uh, my friend Nasir, who's uh, sitting in front of a computer wearing something white, uh, but he's a computer scientist in the Department of Computer Science here at Morik as well. So uh, that's why he scores over here. And then we have a few other pathologists uh, this is a pathologist who is using computer screens and more and more pathologists are actually using computer screens in their daily lives, in their professional lives uh, for diagnosing cancer by digitizing the tissue. And instead of using a microscope, they use a computer monitor uh, those images. So this is a, this is a uh, pathologist who is wearing white, but they have uh, a computer screen in front of them. That's why they are over here at this point in the feature space. And then we have another pathologist who has two screens, and then they have, uh, they're also wearing white. So that's why they have this particular position in the feature space. Now, what we have done so far is we have represented different individuals as that we were given in this feature space. And as you can see, this gives a pretty good idea of how we can go ahead and design a predictor now. Let's say we want to separate these two classes. So the first class is whether a person is a computer scientist. So let's call them the positive class. And then we have a pathologist class, okay? And whether that, we can call them the negative class, okay? So all of these are positive examples, the one in red, whereas all the ones in green are negative examples. And what we want to do is to identify a function that allows us to separate these two types of examples. Now, if I use a simple line to separate the two classes uh, in this feature space, we can do that. Oh, here's another pathologist hiding at the bottom over there. We can use the line like this. And if you use a line like this, then what I see in the training set is that it's classifying all the computer scientists correctly because all the computer scientists are to the one side of this line. But in, patho in, in terms of pathologists, it's making some errors. It's classifying this pathologist, this pathologist, and this pathologist as computer scientists, okay? So this line is making some errors, and we can calculate how many errors it's making. Out of the six pathologists that I have in this data set, it's misclassifying three of them. So that's why the error is three by six in terms of the pathologist. So that's 0.5. It's not misclassifying any of the computer scientists because all of the computer scientists are on the same side or on the correct side. So there are no errors in, uh, in the, based on this line in terms of computer scientists. So the overall error with that we can sum, so this is called a misclassification error. So misclassification error. So that comes out to be 0.5 for this particular line. And you can very well imagine what we are, and you can calculate exactly what would be the error of this line. Let's call this the first line, line one. Let's call this line two. And we can calculate the error for this particular line. And if we do that, then we see that out of the four computer scientists that we had, it's misclassifying one of them. So in terms of computer scientists, it has uh, an error of one by four. This is a computer scientist that is being misclassified by L2. And uh, all of the other computer scientists are being classified correctly. Out of the pathologists, now this L2 line is misclassifying only one pathologist, which is at, there at the bottom. And if you calculate the overall error, then one out of six pathologists is being misclassified and one out of four computer scientists is being misclassified. So the error of this line, L2, is 0.42. The error for line one was 0.5. So this line is a better approximator or a better classifier than this line L1. So it's very simple, right? And if we use this definition of error, what we want to do is to find a line in this case that gives us zero error over the training set or minimum error over the training set. And we, we can have this line, let's say, let's call this line three, which doesn't give any error now for either the pathologists or the computer scientists. All the computer scientists have been separated. The technical term here is shattered. So this data set has been shattered. Okay. 
by this particular line, that means there is no training error at least in this uh, in this particular problem based on this line. Okay, sorry. Okay, so no no error there and. Now we can use this classifier to classify unknown people. This is another of my friends who's a pathologist, uh, and he has got two computer screens in front of him, and he's not wearing white. So probably he is going to be misclassified as a computer scientist. This is another of my friends who's uh, a computer scientist. He doesn't have a computer screen in front of them, so he might be confused with uh, not being a computer scientist at least. The point that I'm trying to get across is Everything you do, every design decision that you make, in terms of the features, in terms of the data that you collect, it's going to have an impact, not only on the training error, but also on the validation error. Whenever you're trying to identify certain features in a machine learning model, you are putting a prior, as it is called, or you're manifesting your own belief about how the problem should be solved. Now, if that belief is correct, for a set of validation examples or for a set of uh, test examples, the machine learning system is going to perform very well in practice. However, that is not always true or may not always be true. So you may have to revisit your design principles. So you may want to, in this case, let's say, identify different features because this failed the validation test. It misclassified this particular line L3, although it gave good classification error or zero classification error on the training data set, but it did generate some errors on the data set that, uh, that I used for validation. So it classified, it would probably classify a pathologist as a computer scientist, and it can classify a computer scientist as a pathologist. So the, the major point is now we can go back. So those are the cycles that I talked about earlier, and then we can visit or revisit those design principles. We can choose a different classifier as well. We can use different data. We can collect more data. Uh, and and uh, that will allow us to design a robust and accurate machine learning model that can be expected to perform better than all of these lines that we have used, L1, L2, and L3. So in, in this part of the lecture, what we have covered is how do we design machine learning models? Remember, we started off with the steps that are involved in the, in the development of a data mining system. You start off with defining the problem over here. Just to reiterate and summarize it for you, you uh, define the problem, you identify a required data set, you pre-process it, you model it by selecting appropriate features and classifiers or other types of machine learning models. Then you train it, that is, do parameter tuning. Uh, of, the, of the machine learning model. And uh, we did that in the example of pathologist versus computer scientist by choosing different lines. So each line is determined by a set of parameters and we're going to talk about that in detail. And choosing different parameters means essentially choosing different lines. So that is what training was. Uh, that is sort of training that we did. Out of, we want to find a line that gives us a minimum error. So that is the training part of it. And then we saw that the best model on training, uh, we obtained line number three, and then we tested it on a couple of examples and it didn't work well, although it was working well for all the training data. So we can revisit all these steps. And then if once we are happy with it, once we have identified all the correct features, we have identified all the correct data, we can go ahead and verify this model and then we can deploy it. So those are the steps that are involved. Again, at a more in a more detailed look, you, what you need is, of course, you need to think about what sensors to use, what sort of feature extraction mechanism you need to use, and what type of machine learning models you want to use. So that at the end, you get something that is robust, works very well in the, in the, in the real world, okay? So that's the sort of uh, stuff that we need to do when designing machine learning models. Let me take a higher level picture of what we just did. If you think about it in terms of machine learning, uh, the steps that we took for classifying pathologists versus computer scientists, those can be broken down into three parts. And this is going to be a consistent theme throughout this module. We are going to take a machine learning model and we are going to break it down into these three principal components. Sorry, I've used principal components too often. 
what I meant to say is we are going to take a machine learning model and break it down to three principal parts. One of them is uh, representation. Number one, the second part is evaluation and the third part is optimization. When we, are, when we have a machine learning model, in this case, what we use is a simple line. It's essentially a classification function that we want to talk about. So if you think about all these lines, this L3 that we developed and L2 and L1, all of them were lines. So we want to pick a representation of the, of the classification function or as it is called the decision function that would allow us to classify between two different classes. In this example, in the pathologist versus computer scientist example, we used a simple line. So the first step is, of course, to represent the features, the examples in the feature space. We did that. And then we want to pick a classification function. In this, in this example, we used a simple line, which can be represented by this equation. Remember, you, uh, if, you, if you remember any high school mathematics or even before that, uh, you would have seen the equation of a line, something written down like something like this. Uh, f of x is equal to ax plus b, or some people write, like to call it mx plus c. If you have two, two x's, x1 and x2, just like this one, you can line represent the equation of a line like this one, w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus b. Here x1 and x2 are the features that we used in this case, in the previous example that we took. These would be the whiteness in dressing and the number of computer screens. And then these three, W1, W2, and W, and this B are the parameters. So these are the parameters of this particular function. So W1, W2, and B. And what by parameter I mean, if you change these values, you essentially end up with a different line. So L1, L2, and L3, they would have different W1, W2, and B values. Okay, so what, we, what we've done is I, we've used a representation of a mathematical function that is flexible and we can control it by changing its parameters. We, and and the, the other part is in this, this was these features that go into this function. So the output of the machine learning model is then going to be in this case, what side of the line a particular example lies on whether it's above the line, in which case this function is going to produce a value greater than zero, or if it's below the line, then it's going to produce a value less than zero. So that's the sort of thing that this allows us to do. The second part is evaluation. In every machine learning model, there's going to be representation. You represent the example, you pick a decision function. The second bit is going to be evaluation, and that essentially means defining an error function, which we did we calculated how many misclassifications a particular parameter choice gives us. So for L1 was a, uh, gave us a higher number of errors or misclassifications. L2 was with a different parameter values, W1 and W2 and B gave us different values of, or give different errors and a slightly reduced one in comparison to L1 uh, for the problem that we were talking about. And L3 gave us no errors. So that was the best one on the training set. Selecting the set of parameter values, W1, W2, and B in this case, through optimization is the third step. We want to find a line that gives us the reduced error. And this, these are the generic steps that, we are, that almost every machine learning model follows. You represent your examples, you pick a machine learning model or the mathematical form of that machine learning model, you define what an error is going to be for your problem, and then you try to reduce that error in optimization. So if you follow these steps, you will end up with, uh, with a machine learning model uh, or, a, or a line in this particular example that gives the least amount of error over the training data. So these steps, these three steps, I would like you to remember and understand very clearly because they are going to, this is going to be a recurring theme throughout the module. We are going to break down each machine learning model into these three parts, representation, evaluation, and optimization. So I call it the REO breakdown, R-E-O breakdown. So we are going to talk about other applications and other problems, and then I'm going to ask you 
throughout the module, not today, to break them down into these three parts. When you are reading, once you are done with this module and you go on to become data scientists or researchers in machine learning, and you're reading a machine learning paper, it's really easy to, to have this at the back of your mind and, and try to break down that particular paper or that particular method into these three parts. What does, uh, what does this particular application or a given application, what is the representation they use? How do they represent their features? That would be the first question that you would need to ask. What is the decision function or the classification function? What is the mathematical form of that that they have? What error function do they use? That means how do they define misclassification? That is going to be the next step. And how do they perform their optimization? That is going to be the third step. If you are done with these three, you have essentially understood and the machine learning model in that particular paper or throughout this module as well. However, it's also important to remember, so however, it's also important to remember that the real test of a machine learning model is not how it performs on the training data. As we saw in the previous example of pathologists versus computer scientists, a machine learning model can give you a zero error over the training set, but it can still misclassify some test examples. The real test of a machine learning model is how it performs on unseen examples. So this is the real test of the machine learning model. How is it, what is its performance on unseen data? So the way we test that is through validation, first of all, and then we can put that model in practice and identify what is performance or characterize its performance. And by performance, I mean, what sort of errors does it generate on unseen data? So just like in the first, very first lecture, we saw that you had a set of paintings and you were able to use your uh, intelligence to classify an unseen example. That's the real test of a machine learning model as well. If a machine learning model generalizes, as it is called, to unseen data, that's what we want. And now this distinction is going to be very important. Optimization, successful optimization over the training set or producing zero error over the training set does not mean directly or does, may not always imply that it generalizes to unseen cases. So what I am going to say is, is going to be a bit technical, but it's really simple if you break it down. And, and that is optimization or successful optimization is not a sufficient condition for generalization. At the same time, it is important to understand that successful optimization or producing low errors over the training set or being able to converge, as, it, as we're going to see, to a satisfactory set of values for the parameters in your math mathematical function is a requirement. So it's not a sufficient condition, but it is a required condition. So it's a necessary condition to, to be able to uh, do well on the, on the test set. So I hope this, this becomes clear. Let me go over this once more uh, with the example that we, we were taking. So you had a pathologist or a computer scientist that was used as input. We extracted some features from it. So we got a set of features. In this case, we got whiteness and dressing and a number of computer screens. Again, real hypoth hypothetical, not very practical features that we got, but it can be any set of features that you may want to extract. Then we choose what is called a classifier because it divides, uh, it classifies our given data. And for, for this particular problem, we use a linear classifier. We use simple lines. And those lines had a mathematical form like this one that's written over here, W1X1 plus W2X2 plus B. And then we use the output of that, whether a particular example is above the line or below the line to classify. And then we computed the error over the training data. So let's say if we have different lines and we calculate uh, the error of each of those lines, then each of those is a single classifier. We can calculate their error based on the known target of the training example. So in this case, if it's a pathologist, so the label will be either plus one or minus one. I think we use minus one in the while I was talking earlier on the previous slide. So, but it doesn't really matter 
So whatever you present over here at the input, you need to present the same training error, uh, training label at during error computation. Once you have that, you can use this error signal. So if the input of the machine learning model is a pathologist, the prediction should also be a pathologist. If it's not, you have an error and you can use this error signal as I'm calling it to retune the line or it's just like tuning a radio. You're choosing different parameters for W1, W2 and D until you are satisfied with the, with the, uh, with the machine learning model over the training data. So what we have tried to cover in this particular part of the lecture is the following. We have discussed a framework that allows you to identify to build machine learning models and data science models. We identified different steps in it. We have seen that you can break down a machine learning model into three, princi three principal parts. Those are uh, representation, including feature representation, how you represent input examples, how you do error calculations on top of that, and how you do optimization to select optimal parameters that allow you to do to reduce the error of the training set. Once that is done, you have with you a machine learning model that gives you the lowest error over the training set. Then you give it to a well, you give the machine learning model some validation examples, and you try to see whether that particular model performs well on those validation examples. If it does, then you can say that it generalizes in unseen cases, and then it's ready to be put into practice. So this is going to be the overall workflow for all machine learning models that we are going to cover. Okay, so I hope this helps. Please try to understand as part of this lecture what representation means, what evaluation means, and what optimization means. Thank you.